Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Sorry about the delay. Um, let me turn off that live transcription note. Okay. All right, so we've been introducing causal loop diagrams in the abstract. And so today we're going to be learning how to draw them um, using BinSim as our kind of tool of choice. Um, so if you got your own laptop and then some uh, available on it, that's great. Um, otherwise, if you're in class, uh, all of these machines, if you log in with your ASU ID, you should have Vincent on them as well. Um, so we'll uh, we'll walk through that. So let's center here things. So um, if you haven't downloaded Vincent at home and would like to, there's instructions on Canvas. If you go to the on the canvas and then click on modules and go under course information there's a little subsection on the software for the course and uh and one of the pages is on downloading vinsim where you can find the instructions here but in short basically go to and you can also just get them off these slides from today and you'll go to a url you fill out a little form make sure to uncheck the subscribe box there they do send you a download link over email and then with that download link you'll be able to download and install um, the um, the tool, and then when you install it, it will ask you like for a license key or something. And then there's a drop down box where you can say, "I'm using it for educational or academic purposes." So you'll still have to put your name in, but you'll be able to leave the license key blank, and it'll allow you to install it. And there won't be any limitations uh, on length of time or anything like that. So um, so that's how you get VinSim. There are a bunch of resources for using VinSim. Um, aside from the lecture today. Uh, so for example, Craig Kirkwood, who's actually an emeritus faculty at ASU over in WP Carey, he taught a system dynamics course where he developed um, a, um, a whole sort of PDF textbook about VinSim um, for his system dynamics course. And it's pretty popular. A lot of other uh, places use it. Um, and it just happens to be kind of hosted here at ASU. It's because again, he's emeritus faculty that the images from that are going to be an older version of VinSim, but I think you'll be able to figure out roughly the correspondence between the newer version. They don't look that different. Um, so that is one you know, free resource you can get on VinSim. Um, and then likewise, there's also these slides. And so, um, the, so I'm gonna go over some examples of how to draw things in VinSim. I might bring up VinSim on my machine. The Windows users, your version of VinSim may look a little newer, uh, the buttons may look a little nicer, uh, but uh, it's all the same stuff as there. So if you're having trouble finding something because it doesn't quite match in terms of the icons, let me know and I can sort of help you find the right thing. But basically everything's in the same space, uh, but or the same place, but maybe some of the graphics have changed a little bit and it just looks a little bit cleaner. So your version might look newer, but it does all the kind of the same stuff. All right. so. Um, when we open up VinSim, and maybe I should just open up VinSim and have it running alongside here. So I'll let it open up here and I'll pull it over to the projector side. And online, um, I think you guys can see this um, online here as well. Um, so, so this this is the basic VinSim screen. If you were to open up VinSim on your local computers here, you'd see something that looks like this. Um, so keep referring to like the canvas and that's just sort of this blank page in here. And then there's a toolbar down here we'll talk about in these sketch tools that are up here. So that's kind of where we're centered here. And so we'll focus first, let me get back to the PowerPoint here, is that up in the very top of VinSim are the sketch tools. And these are the kind of most important things and because we're only worried about causal loop diagrams right now, not stock and flow diagrams, then we're looking at a very limited set of these. And so we focus on the little variable tool, the arrow tool, and the loop annotation or the comment tool. So we're going to use the variable tool to draw the words for the causal loop diagrams. Then we want to draw links between them and label the link polarities. We'll use the arrow tool. It's kind of the link tool. And then if we want to then label the feedback loops, whether it's a positive loop, a negative loop, et cetera, then the comment uh, tool will allow us to do that. 
So those are kind of the three ones that we're going to focus on here. Um, now, there are some additional useful tools like this little hand over here. This move size is how we can move things around the canvas and how we can access some of the additional parameters. If you ever want to delete something off of here, um, you might like be tempted to right click on it and go to delete or whatever, but the delete tool is the standard way to do that in VinSim. So you hit the delete and then you go down and hit what you want to delete on the canvas. So these are the main things we're focusing on here. So I'm just going to step through these. So if um, the first thing we would do in VinSim is create variables for our causal loop diagram. So let's say I want to model the or or start to model the causal interactions in the hunger regulation loop. Well, then I would go up to this variable button here, and then I would click anywhere on the canvas and start typing. So I can do that. I'll tab over to my VinSim here, and I'm going to go up and click on the variable tool, and then I'm going to click on a blank space, and I can just type hunger. And if I hit enter, it creates this little hunger here. Now, um, it's pretty small, it's hard to read. So um, there are things I can do with that. Let me see if I can grab this little handle here. So notice there's a, a handle in the corner here, which allows you to kind of grab these things and move them around. Um, what I'm gonna do is right click on the canvas, which brings up this view defaults. And this is kind of jumping ahead a little bit. And I'm gonna change the default font size on mine to something big just because I'm projecting. And that'll make that a little bit bigger. So you might not need to do that on yours, but I'm just going to do it on mine. All right, so that's the one uh, one. Now if I want um, to if I want to then uh, view another variable, I would just do that same thing and I'm going to do an amount eaten next to it. So I just go over to my Vinsim, I hit you know leave it on the variable tool go over to the right of it, and I can type amount eaten. Not eaten. Um, I just, um, if I click on that again. So if I just left click on it once, it allows me to edit it as long as I'm still in the variable tool, and then I can fix my error. There we go. All right, so that's where we are so far. Um, pretty easy. Any questions on that? Everybody found the tool? Yeah, in the back. I'll go over that again, but basically if you right click on any white space here, it'll bring up the defaults for the whole thing, and then you can edit that. It's also there um, down here. Um, you can, uh, well, I'll go over this again, but all of the kind of like fonts, uh, the current font settings are down here too. Yep. If you would like, the question was, should we, you be following along? If you would like, it would be helpful. Um, then you're absolutely feel free to follow along. Um, but um, if if you don't have been some of it running and you just want to follow me through this narrative, that's fine too. So whatever works for you. Okay, so now um, you know links are kind of the the lifeblood of um, these. And I'm just going to double check the chat here and make sure that nobody's screaming for me to stop online. I don't think anybody is. All right, good. All right, so now the next thing we need, oops, okay, good. So the, uh, so the next thing we need are links. So we're gonna need to draw a link showing the causal dependency between hunger and amount eaten. And so as you might expect, all we're going to do is just go and hit the link, the arrow tool up here. And then I'm going to click on where I want the arrow to be anchored. And then I'm going to click on where I want the other side of it to be. And that will create a nice little arc between the two of them. So let's see what that looks like. And Vinsim, go over to get back into Vinsim here. Okay, so I've got a bunch of um, other overlays here, which is the reason why I'm... Okay, here, so now I've got this hunger. Um, so um, I am going to click on the arrow tool or try to, and then I'm gonna hit 
I'm going to say I want to go from amount eaten to hunger. And then notice there is a little handle. So there's this little blue or uh, the, the blue arrow is drawn and there's a little circle there right in the middle of that. We call that a handle. And we can drag that circle around to make this arch up or down. And so I'm going to try to do that as best as I can. So it might be easier for me to click the move first. And then with the move, I'm going to try to grab that on the, um, the screen here. Unfortunately, because so I'm going to pull this over so that I can, I can have a little bit more dexterity and then I'll pull it back. There we go. So you see if I manage to grab that little handle and drag it up, then I create that nice arc. And so I can do that there, drag handle just curvature, and then I can do the arc back the other way as well. So I can now click on, I can go back to the arrow tool up here, then I can go to hunger and go the other direction of Mount E. So that is what we'll end up doing eventually here. But before we do that, um, I would like to label this causal link, whether it's a positive or a negative. So how do I do that? Well, if I right click on the handle, it will bring up these options that allow you to do all those cool labels that we see in the causal loop diagrams in the book. So I, again, I'm going to try my best to right click on a giant screen on the other side of me here. And yeah, so I'm gonna to need to drag this back and do it on this screen and then bring it over. So I'm right clicking on the um, handle and it's bringing up this exact same box that we see over here. And now I can go through and I can say, um, all right, I, I wanted to have an arrowhead. Do I want a delay mark? So if I wanted to put a delay there um, and I could say, well, this is from hunger to amount eaten. So um, as I'm hungry, maybe I eat more and that's immediate. So I don't want the delay mark, but maybe on the other side, I will want the delay mark. I can choose line things and then under polarity. Um, well, since as I eat things, um, so as I get hungry, I'm going to eat more. So the link from hunger to amount eaten, I want to be positive. So I can select the plus, which is what I'm gonna do, or I could select the S for same, those are synonyms. So you can either do a plus or an S. And, um, and then I can say, do I want that, the plus or the S that I draw um, near the arrowhead? Do I want it on the handle? Do I want it on the inside? Do I want it on the outside? So I can just wear that, that puts it there. And then as I drag the link around, it'll always make sure that that arrow or that plus stays near the arrow. So that's what I'm gonna go ahead and do is I'm gonna select plus or you could do S for same. I'm gonna leave it on arrowhead and inside. I'll hit okay or I'll try to. Oh, so right now you're not seeing it but occasionally this annoying box comes up and it says, do you wanna save the sketch to enable automated backup? And it just takes all focus away. Um, some yes is great, and then you can just save it, and that way it'll stop doing that. Um, so, and what it's saying here is if you manage to save it, then, um, and so I just think it's usually gonna usually pop up like a little box asking me where to save it. If you end up saving it um, then somewhere, then occasionally it'll take backups. And so if Vincent dies for some reason, it'll be able to recover from that backup. So that's all it's saying there. So I'm gonna hit that okay. And then now if I bring my, my this back over, then I can see there's my plus. Now I slight I left it on the default for inside. That's kind of ugly. So maybe I should have put it on the outside. You can go ahead and, and collect and select the outside on yours if you want to try it. And then it'll put it on this side of the arrow. I'm just going to leave it on plus just so um, it just, uh, just because I want to make it a little easier on me right now. But um, ideally probably I put that plus on the outside because it's looking a little cramped right here. Okay, and then I can do the same for the other side. And so um, I will, so amount eaten. Oh, I'm sorry, and I had this flipped. 
this should be a negative. So I guess I do have to go back in. I, in my head, I had hunger on this side. So a Mount Eaton, as I eat more, my hunger goes down. So this should be a negative. So I'm gonna go and actually fix that. So I will take my Vinsim right here, go back over, click, right click on this thing, bring this back up. And on here, let me, this will make it easier for me, I think. Yeah. And then, so I'm gonna change this to a negative feedback. And then under font, I'm going to click on that font, which will bring up this font selection. And under color, this little minus says the default color, which the default color is blue. You can change that. But I'm going to say, don't do the default color, make it red. Because I want red to be um, my uh, color for negative feedback. And that will just color the minus sign red. So if I also want to color the line red, then um, up here, uh, da, 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 I can go up to this color and I can also make it red. And then if I hit okay there, and then I bring my VinSim back over, then now I see I get this. And again, I, maybe I'll just put that on the outside. So let me see if I can right click. I am, there we go. And then I'm gonna say, put this on the outside because I just think it looks better that way. Okay, I'm exhausted. So, um, so that's that one link um, that we draw there. It should be easy for us to draw the other link now. So I'll just kind of be a little faster here. I'm gonna go arrow, tool, go from hunger to Mount Eaton, grab the little handle, pull it down, right click on the little handle, bring these settings options over. Say I want hum from hunger to a Mount Eaton. I'll make this a plus. I'll do it on the outside. Um, the default color is blue, I'm happy with that. So if I click okay, there we go. I got my negative feedback loop. Questions about this? Yeah. I missed the part where you turned the arrow red. Okay, great. So um, if you right click on the handle for the one that you want to turn red, there we go. Then I, in this dialog here, at the very top, there's this little color, which for you, if you haven't changed it, we'll just have a little minus sign there, which means the default color, which is blue, because that's the default color down here. And so um, I just changed, I clicked that and then selected red. I also changed the red font so that the minus was also red. Any other questions? Now, strictly speaking, if you're uh, doing an assignment in this class where you're drawing a causal loop diagram, um, the text is far more important than the colors. So, um, so Eric is not gonna take off if all of your links are red or all of your links are blue, or maybe you flip you know, a, a, um, a color. Um, the important thing is imagine if you were to print it in black and white, would it still be readable? And so the pluses and minuses are more important than the colors, but the colors are just kind of helpful. At least they're helpful for me when I draw these things. All right. So we're good on that. Okay, so let's go back to the main story here. All right, so now we have to label our feedback loop. Um, and oh, and notice I also put a delay here. Why don't I go ahead and do that as well? So um, I know from when I eat something, it takes a while for my hunger to be reduced. So I wanna put the little delay symbol. So I'm gonna go back to my VinSim and I'll go over to this handle right click on that handle it brings up this dialog box and at this dialog box i'm going to click delay mark and that should put the that little delay symbol there suggesting that this way hunger to amount eaten is relatively fast but amount eaten back to hunger is relatively slow okay All right, so now I just need to label this feedback loop. And so I'm gonna now use the comment tool. So basically we're gonna click on the comment tool and then we're gonna click on the space in between here. It's, and it's just gonna add an annotation. Now this annotation is not gonna be tied to any of the links, but if you were to drag this thing around, you usually would drag 
you select a geometric area and you end up pulling it around with it. But it's not smart enough to know, like, if you're to move this link around, it's going to move the, the annotation down. So it's really just a, a, an independent thing that's on the canvas. And so I'll go into VinSim and I'll click on the comment and I'll click somewhere in the middle here. And it brings up this giant comment dialog box here, all sorts of options. And so this is a negative feedback loop because it has one negative link, an odd number of negative links. So I am gonna look under comment description here and, um, and I will say that, um, so this is where I could put a name for this loop. So I could call this the um, hunger, regulation loop or something like that. Um, or I could just put, you know, I could put, you know, a symbol in here, like a plus or a minus. Um, but down here, there's this little image. And if I click on that, then I can actually find that they already have images that are available for me that can sit in there along with that text, kind of like in the Moorcroft textbook. So I could choose the little balancing thing here because that's one way to write that. I could choose um, a minus. I could choose um, this symbol here, the snowball, well, not the snowball effect. So there's a bunch of different um, uh, symbols here that you can use for negative feedback. You can also have these symbols that I wouldn't recommend, but like for vicious and virtuous cycles and things like that. So we mainly stick with minus plus, the balance, the snowball, and these symbols here, kind of these top ones here. So I'm just gonna select um, minus to be conventional, but I think in the PowerPoint slides, I use the balancing beam thing. And if I want to, I could also change the colors of things. And so I could say that I want my text position to be centered. I want the color because it's negative, maybe I'll make it red. Um, Maybe I'll make this red here. And let's see what happens if I do that. Okay, so what happened here is due to the font size, um, I can't really read much of anything here. So I'm gonna drag this out and see if I can make this larger. Starting to grow. All right, so now we can see that um, I dragged it up there and you can see hunger regulation is giant and the minus is right in between. That's not ideal. So I can go back to my comment tool and I can click, I just right clicked on it while in the comment tool. And maybe I'll say, I want my text position to be above. Let's see how that looks. And now I've got this hunger regulation and a minus. Now I'd like to have a, this have the little clockwise or counterclockwise loop around it. So I'm gonna right click on that. And I'm gonna say loop clockwise. And then finally, I've got, I think kind of what I wanted here. I've got the loops labeled, it's got a minus, it's got the clockwise loop. So this is starting to look pretty good. So I can maybe grab this handle and make it a little smaller. And that doesn't look so bad. I need to make room for it in here. So maybe I'll go to my move size tool here. So this takes me a little longer just because it's an awkward interface. And uh, I've got the delay from Zoom. And I see there's a question online. I'll get to that in just a second after I save this. Come on. And then I can grab this guy and try to put it in between. Okay, there. Um, I apparently was meant to do counterclockwise. So my bad, I'm gonna right click on the annotation using the annotation tool so that it matches up to what I drew. Comment, right click, and then 
this is my comment tool that pops up. And so I'll do loop counter. All right, now that's starting to look a lot better. So I've got a nice label on this loop. This is clearly in the same direction as this thing. It's labeled as a negative feedback. It's red because it's negative. So, so there we are. There was a question online. Uh, could you go over how to make it a loop on the second uh, system? Um, I don't want to know what you mean by on the second system. I, I think you mean like, how do I, where did I get the little counterclockwise loop? Is that the question? Okay, yeah. So if I, you right click on the comment to bring up the comment settings, then in the appearance, notice that there's, there's all these different options. There's none, box, clear box, triangle, up triangle, loop clockwise with counter. We'll probably never use those, but we'll use these loop clockwise and loop counter and the none pretty um, uh, common or often. So you can select loop clockwise or loop counter and it'll put a little loop around whatever image you select down here. Now, if you don't want to use these images, if you wanted to use, use a plus using this font, I could have said instead of hunger regulation, I could have put a plus in there and just made and then told it that it, I wanted to put that plus in the center, which is right here. And then that uh, loop counter would have gone around the plus, but I just used the image instead because they already had an image of a plus. Okay, looks like that cleared it up online. Any questions in class about how we got those annotations? Yeah, and the back. Yes. Yep. Gotcha. Right. So if I if you go back uh, to the the diagram here, and uh, let me move this. So there's, if you click on the move tool, it's probably easiest. And then you try to click on the, um, the, the annotation. You should hopefully see somewhere a little handle. It might be off on the corner. And if not, I can walk back there and take a quick look. See the um, the handle right there that you can grab that and make it. So that's the minus sign there. So that that's exactly what we have up there. Yeah, it's just like really thick. Yeah, I mean, so that is, that right. That's I mean, so if you if the image for you, so I mean, you, what you can do with that is you can play with your font size. So I think the issue there is that the image is like so many pixels. And if your font is small, the image relative to your font, the image is gonna look kind of bigger. And so you can play around with the relative sizing of your font and the images. And I think it'll change the kind of thickness of that line. Or you can just, like I said, use a text line instead. And you can put two annotations here. You can put a loop annotation with a little text minus, and then you could add a second annotation on top of it that says hunger regulation. Question in front. That is the variable um, right here, up here where it says variable, I click that. And then you just click anywhere and it'll create it. And then it looks like I've somehow accidentally, okay, there we go. That little box was, yeah, question? Yeah, so if you go to the arrow tool up here, and then you um, hover over this handle until it turns into a hand. You can then right click on that and it'll bring up the arrow tools configuration. At the very top, there's a check mark that says delay mark. If you check that on, it should put those two little lines there. Were you? Uh... Oh, well, you just um, so just mouse uh, yeah. so mouse over the the circle and then try hitting a right click now. Oh, yeah, you want it. Um, 
Or you, you can do it okay. if you, yeah. There we go. Oh. <laughs> so, and then you can click the delay mark. So maybe two finger instead of one. Yep. Um, and I think I saw a question online. What do we got here? For some reason, whenever I try to add a variable to my model, the application quits. I might just have to restart my um, laptop, but I'll try that after class. So um, especially if you're using, um, in the old days, the Mac version of VinSim was particularly unstable and it would randomly you know, crash. Um, I Sometimes saving your work as just a, a you know, just a model file, an MDL file, uh, relieved that, or just starting with a new uh, new expression. They Vincent claimed that they that things have gotten better, and it's been my experience that things have gotten a little bit better. It's a little more stable, but if for some reason it's very unstable on your system, then when we get to the stock and flow uh, diagrams, then you might decide that you're just going to use Insight Maker instead because Vincent's too frustrating to use. That's one of the reasons I teach both of these. The downside of the Insight Maker is it doesn't have all of these cool ways to quickly annotate links. And so if you don't want to use Insight Maker to draw causal loop diagrams, if worse comes to worse, I'm okay with you using another draw tool like PowerPoint or you know the draw tool inside Word or whatever, but you're just gonna to have to manually put the pluses and minuses in instead of having them automatically pop up on the links. So hopefully if you close VinSim and reopen it and save the model, then uh, it'll settle down. Or like you say, if you reboot, then on the next reboot, it'll it'll be a little bit more stable. Um, you know, nine times out of ten, Vincent works pretty well, but that one time out of ten, it could be really frustrating. All right, any other questions? I'll go through and hit OK here, and get back to the PowerPoint. So this is just all we did. I hit the comment, went in that area, brought up the giant comment box, got a bunch of options here that I can play with. So in this case, I selected um, the balance. I named it food intake control and I ended up getting there. So that's another example of how it might look. So a different image. All right. So now that I've done that, and let's say I wanna then put one of these things in um, a, a Word document, let's say, you know, for a report or for a homework assignment. Um, Vincent makes it pretty easy to do that. You basically you can use the move tool, the little hand, the move size tool there to draw uh, a select box. And if you draw it super wide, it's gonna include all the white space. So it, it isn't just selecting, it's actually choosing how much white space you want in the margins. And then from there, you can just do copy and paste into another application. It'll might make a nice vector-based image, which basically means that when you paste it into Word or PowerPoint or whatever, if you try to scale it up and down, uh, because it's vector-based, it's not gonna get all pixely. And so it's much better than like a screenshot. So you could you know, do a screen capture to grab this image, but if you'd use the actual copy, so there's a copy tool right up here, or you can right click, I think, and say copy, then you'll get a much higher quality image to put into your reports. And so I can do that. I go into VinSim, bring my mouse somewhere over here. My mouse seems to have disappeared. Right there, I think. Well, I'm gonna to try to do this mouseless. All right, so on my, I think due to an issue with um, sharing screen and things like that, I've at least temporarily lost my mouse. And so, but I'm gonna do my best here. So I basically selected the whole box there. I can either go up to the copy tool that's up here and click copy. Um, which I actually just did there. And then if I were to bring up like Word, Somewhere, there it is. It's, it seems like Word updates so often on my computer that every time I open it, it has to verify it. So then if I open up Word like that, 
can create a new blank document and I can paste in voila. So now I can put causal loop diagrams in my documents. And like I said, I can scale them up and down and I won't, they won't get real pixely. So I can make them smaller and bigger and so on. So you can use those in PowerPoint. You can use those in your reports, your homeworks, et cetera. All right, so that's um, the basics of drawing a simple loop. So before we go on to a couple of the other more advanced features of formatting in VimSim, are there any questions about any of that? Yeah. This whole function is deleted. Um, so, did you try making the making the uh, the box a little bit bigger? Yeah. Oh yeah. So, uh, well, it's possible that if you zoom in and out on the, or if you try to drag that <clears throat> the one in Word, um, making it smaller and bigger. Like I, I think it's probably just a rendering issue. If it's not, <clears throat> something we we'll probably have to look at offline. Any other questions online? Any questions? Looks like it's okay. All right, so what other little tools do we have when we're drawing these things in VinSim? Well, so I already mentioned this one. If you right click on white space here, you can adjust the defaults, like the default color, which is blue, the default font, et cetera. So that's a nice way to adjust those. You might want to do those ahead of time if you don't like the, the size. The other thing is down at the bottom here, what's cool is if you highlight a bunch of things up in VinSim, then Whatever is highlighted, you then can immediately change properties of all of those things using this down here. And so you can highlight them all and then you can say, all right, well, I don't want them to be 12 points. These ones here, I want to be 30 points. And so those that are highlighted, I click on the 12, I change it to 30. So if I highlight a bunch of links or something like that, I want to say like, after I could draw everything. Don't worry about color whatsoever. And then once I'm done, I can select all the uh, negative links. And then once they're all selected simultaneously, like using the shift, you shift click and then select them all, then I could click this blue and change it to red. So it's a quick way to kind of batch edit a bunch of graphical elements and then sim all at once. Okay, so any questions? Pretty clear. So just so you know, you're gonna have a homework assignment where you're just gonna do a uh, drawing like these um, so that, um, let me try to get this. I didn't realize that was at the top here. All right, it's over here. And so you're gonna be practicing this on this homework, which is formally assigned today. Okay, there we go. Man. All right, sorry for my kludginess here. Uh, there's a question, do any of the computers in the library have it downloaded? I know um, I did ask for computers in the commons areas um, to have VinSim installed and the ticket said they did. And so you should be able to have get access to VinSim not just on these computers, but on um, computers, um, I don't know if it's in all of the, pu the publicly available computing labs, but I was told that it is. If it isn't, let me know and I'll request it. And it doesn't take IT very long to install it. All right, great. So that was our basic intro. So I'm going to skip the attendance exercise for a second here. And um, so let's, so we're basically what uh, you're going to use Vincent to draw these simple loops. And so let's make sure that we kind of understand these loops for sure. So getting back to kind of more, um, more generic, you know, uh, causal loop diagrams. So here's an example causal loop diagram that I grabbed from um, some, I think I grabbed from the National uh, Research Council. So this was trying to communicate the vicious cycle that is global warming. And so they put up here, temperatures rise, Arctic ice sea melts, as reflective ice disappears, darker ocean warm water absorbs more heat. And so it's clear that they're trying to sort of indicate that there's a positive feedback here, but they're not really using the rules that we've kind of learned here. So what's, um, what do you think is, is wrong with some of these terms that they picked? 
how do these not really fit a causal loop diagram very well? Yeah, in the back. Yeah, it should be like like a phrase, like a noun phrase. Yeah. Right, so the, so both of the so they're, so they're kind of we're getting there should be a short phrase and then re more refined should be noun phrases and so temperature rise it's kind of has like a verb in there so it's hard to say like what happens to temperatures rise we just know what's happened to temperature and then similarly I hope you can see that Arctic ice sea melts it's the same issue we really would just care about Arctic sea ice not really Arctic sea ice melts so um, so if we wanted to improve this loop. We might say, let's bring up the pen here. We might just make this Arctic sea ice. And we might just make this temperatures. And then um, this, as reflective ice disappears, darker ocean water absorbs more heat. Does anybody know like a nice noun phrase that represents the reflectiveness of the water back in the, in the middle really? Albedo. Albedo, right. So maybe that's something that instead of this ugly thing, I'm just going to, this is going to be terrible. I'm going to try to write albedo. And hopefully not do something terrible like libido or something else here. <laughs> Ugh. Okay. All right. So now we've at least got our variables. So now we got to label the relationships here. So, um, so let's just start at the bottom here. Um, so albedo. So as reflectiveness of the water increases, so if we were to increase the albedo of the earth, what would happen to temperatures? How many people would say they go up? How many people would say they go down? Any votes online? In person, it looks like we've had a lot of uh, that goes down. And I would say that's probably, for me, I would say that's a down. So the way my conceptual model of albedo is, is that if you make the earth more reflective, more of the energy of the sun gets reflected out into space. And so you don't get as much warming. And so temperatures are going to maybe decrease. Now, if we focus on temperatures, if temperatures were to increase, then what's going to happen to Arctic ice, uh, Arctic sea ice? So, uh, so how many people think this link here should be a plus? How many people think it should be a minus? So it's been about half and half. Anybody online? I see a down. So, um, so what a plus would mean was that as temperatures, as it gets hotter, we get more ice. So remember, I. I took out this melts here. So it's just the ice itself. So if we focus on just the ice, so I'll just write ice to be clear here, the, um, or even ice amount. So maybe I'll do ice AMT. So here I'm saying that as temperatures increase, what happens to the amount of ice? I would think that it probably goes down. So it gets hotter on the earth, you get more melting ice, so the amount of ice decreases. So I'm going to put a minus there as well. Does everybody see the minus there? Anybody have questions or think that seems okay? Now, if I focus on the ice, if the ice increases, we get more ice, does the earth become more reflective or less reflective? Are you more reflective? How many people say more? How many people say less? Anybody online? So we're in a lot of votes, but there's kind of at least sounds like most people were leaning towards more. And I would go for that as well. So the ice tends to be more reflective than seawater. Ice is white, uh, seawater is dark. So seawater absorbs heat, ice reflects heat. So if we have more ice, then we have a greater albedo. So maybe I'll put this plus up here to make it a little clearer. So we've got a minus, a minus, and a plus. We've got two minuses. So two minuses is an even number of negative links. So what type of loop is that? How many people say positive? How many people say negative? 
Anybody online? All right, so it looks like we're getting more voting for positive, and that's what I would say too. So this inside loop here, I'm gonna say is a positive loop, um, otherwise called a reinforcing loop, um, which is a vicious cycle. So, um, so this is saying that um, you know, vicious cycles can go, if you manage to increase the amount of ice, then you'll end up increasing the amount, like it could go the other way, but what we're kind of saying here is it's, you know, it's the other side of it is the problem is temperatures increase, you decrease the ice, which increases how much, uh, which decreases the albedo, which is going to cause an increase in temperatures again. So increase temperature, decrease ice, decrease albedo because of the plus, and then because of the minus, increase in temperature. So um, and maybe you can see why some people, instead of doing minuses and pluses, like to use opposite and same. Because we can say, if you get an increase in temperature, you'll get the opposite things happening to ice, a decrease in ice. If you get a decrease in ice, you'll get the same thing happening to albedo, a decrease in the albedo. If you get a decrease in the albedo, you'll get the opposite thing happening to temperature, which will be a further increase in temperature. And then we get the positive feedback. So any questions about, yeah. Um, do you mean this negative here? So, um, so that's because if, if we were to increase albedo, we have to say what would happen to temperature. And so if we make the earth more reflective, temperature goes down. So that's an opposite relationship, which is why we do a minus there. So the minus is really all about how does this thing on, on the head of the arrow, how does the thing on the arrowhead side, how does it change in response to a, a change on the other side of the arrow? And if it does the same thing, it's a plus. If it does the opposite thing, it's a minus. Does that make sense? Any other questions? Okay, great. All right, so now here's another one we can play with here. So this is one that's actually taken out of some of Forrester's uh, textbooks. Diagram showing a flow of water here. So we got a bucket and water is being filled up into the bucket and someone is watching the water level. So you see this is an eye that's watching the water level and they might have a target water level say up here and the water is being filled up to that target water level. And so as the water raises, they might, they use their hand to change the flow of water, hoping to eventually regulate it so that it doesn't go over the level and, over, and, and overflow, but also they don't want an empty bucket. So they're trying to raise it up to there. So we have to figure out what our variables would be here. Well, we can look at some of the variables in the diagram. There's water level, there's flow of water. So those are kind of two uh, clear ones. So I might say, well, let's just try that. I'm gonna put water level, maybe right here. And I'm going to put, um, I might actually, well, yeah, that's fine. I'll put water level there and I'll put flow of water down here. So the WL is the water level and the F is the flow. So if I'm thinking about water that's initially under the target, that the eye is watching here, then as the water increases, what do you think will happen to the flow? So the water is getting closer and closer to the target line, to the top of the bucket. So as water increases, what happens to the flow? How many people think this should be a minus? How many people think it should be a plus? It's kind of a back and forth. Online, do we have any comments? Feel free to put it in the chat. I see pluses online. So for me, I would think that, you know, if this was a plus, then that would mean that as the water gets higher, the person looking at the flow is gonna turn on more water. So, um, and that I think would just cause the water to overflow because as the water starts low, it would be at one flow level. And as it gets closer to the line, as the water level goes up, if they just turn the water on more and more, then this would just accelerate until you're overflowing the bucket. 
If your goal is to just fill the bucket and stop, then as the water level goes up, your flow is gonna go down. So that's why we might expect to see a negative here. Now on the flip side of that, if you do flip up, turn up the flow, you're going to more quickly turn up the water level. So this I would put here as a plus because whatever you do to the flow is going to create um, relative. So if we think about whatever the flow was, if I increase the flow, the water level will be higher than it was if I left the flow alone. If I decrease the flow, the resulting water level will be lower than what it was than if I left the flow alone. So relative to how things were before I made the change, then I have a positive relationship here. So there are questions about that, that I've got a positive going from flow to water level, but a negative going from water level back to flow. Does that make sense? Questions online. So if that is, if those are my two links, then I need to label this loop inside here. And I see this is a loop that has an odd number of negative links. So how many people think it's a positive feedback loop? How many people think it's a negative feedback loop? Okay, now we've got a pretty good consensus in here. Online? So I would call it a negative feedback loop or a balancing feedback loop is how I would label that. Okay, questions on this example here. So this is the kind of canonical negative feedback loop. They always kind of look like this. And so if I were to sort of um, gen uh, generalize, I guess, this is what I would sort of see. I'd have, um, and this is the, you could think of the action here. This is the flow. So I'll say this is F. The level here, well, that's my water level. And so it, it flipped the order. And my goal, this is my target water level. So it's like the top of the bucket. And so that's our standard balancing or negative feedback loop. So if I ask you to come up with a negative feedback loop, then you can sort of draw this shape and then try to then fill in the gaps here and try to think well, what sort of things regulate. I like to use cruise control as an example. So in cruise control, I've got um, my speed. I've got my target speed, that's the goal. And I've got maybe the throttle or the, you know, how far I push down on the pedal. So, and that's this thing here. So if I'm under my speed, then I am, so if the, my speed increases, so I've gone faster, then maybe I'll decrease how much I'm pushing on the pedal. If I increase how much I push on the pedal, my speed is gonna increase. And so now if I change my target, if I go from 40 miles per hour to 60 miles per hour, then I'm naturally going to increase in action, but eventually my speed will catch up and then the action will decrease after it catches up. And so that's our generic negative feedback loop. Any questions about this here? Okay. Now, in real life, buckets often have leaks. And so the more water you have in the bucket, the more uh, weight is on top of that leak and the more um, uh, water you'll have coming out of the bucket. And we can model that. And so here we've got the, the loop up top is filling the bucket, but there is another negative feedback loop, which is emptying the bucket. So nature is trying to empty the, feed, the bucket where it tries harder and harder, the higher the water level is and less and less when the bucket's empty. Um, and then we are trying to keep the bucket full. And so when we couple two balancing feedback loops, we have this so-called escalation behavior. And so we already saw examples of escalation behavior in the last lecture. And so even though these seem like very different systems, bucket, a leaky bucket, or a house that is trying to regulate its temperature, or a car market, all of these have this same feature where you can find a negative feedback loop coupled to another negative feedback loop 
with some variable that seems to be staying constant in between, like the water level. And even though that variable is staying constant, to keep it constant, you're constantly, you have to have a, a constant flow of water to compensate for the constant outflow of water. And as those things balance, you have this constant waste as you're put, putting water in, just to have it come out, but then the water level is staying constant there. So that's what we refer to as escalation behavior, is that these two forces are fighting against each other. And like kind of the Red Queen, um, you know, in Wizard of Oz, then they're running on a treadmill just to stay in the same place. So this is kind of a Red Queen effect, um, you know, generic two balancing loops counteracting each other. All right, questions on this, this archetype? So we build up these archetypes. All right, so um, we do other examples here. So this is another uh, apparent causal loop diagram that I just grabbed out of other literature. And it's not really a great causal loop diagram, but I can understand why they've done certain things. So one thing is they put boxes around the variables. And I can tell you the system dynamics people, they hate that. So they say causal loop diagrams should only have words and lines. There should not be boxes. Boxes you get when you get the like stock and flow diagrams. They just complicate things because there's extra edges there. And really the only edges you could see are the links. So that's one thing, that's a minor thing. Um, the other thing though is notice they have births twice. They have births down here and they have births up here. Now I can tell that they did that because they wanted to kind of um, separate out that the effect that up here, you just have a standard population effect here where as you get more individuals, you get more births. But down here, as you get uh, less food supply, you get less births. So they wanted to kind of pull those two things out. But we generally um, would prefer that they would have, instead of drawing a second, instead of drawing this second births right here, it would have been better just to draw the arrow back up to this one. And that way we would have, um, we would have two arrows going, through. so we'd have the population effect on births as well as the food supply effect on births, but we'd have a single variable that brings everything together rather than kind of getting this births kind of split up there. So that would be the ideal way to do things. Um, now, if we did that, so if I get rid of this line here and this line here, then now we can mark off what um, these links are gonna be. And so, um, this population births population here, this is your standard positive feedback growth loop. Whenever you see something that looks like growth, it's probably gonna have a positive feedback. So let's confirm that. As I get more population, I'm gonna have more births because each individual will have more, off, uh, more opportunity to have offspring. But then I have more births, I eventually will get more population. And you could argue that maybe both of these need a delay on them. Maybe, but the plus is you definitely could argue there. So I've got a positive feedback loop here. So if I wanted to, I could try to put a little plus there. Now there's more interesting things happening here. So this is modeling that as I get more population, um, then I, the more population I have, what's gonna happen to food supply? As you get more mouths eating the food supply, the food supply is gonna decrease. And so that suggests a negative. Now, if I forget that I wrote that negative and focus on the food supply, I can ask if I got more food supply, what would happen to deaths? Well, if you get more food supply, then you might have less deaths. Or if you go the other way around, if I got less food supply, what would happen to death? Deaths would go up. So these two things are opposite relationships. So I can put another negative here. Well, then I'd say, well, what happens? What about this last one here? Well, if I had more deaths, what's going to happen to population? Well, um, if I got more deaths, I'm going to reduce my population. Or the other way around, if I got fewer deaths, my population will be higher than it was if I didn't have those deaths. And so there's an opposite relationship there. So this is one of those ones where I think I, people asked last time, what happens if you have all negative feedbacks? Let me give you an example of that. Well, this loop here has three negative feedbacks. So the ultimate effect of this thing is it is a negative feedback loop because there's an odd number of negatives. So that is a balancing loop. And then the last loop that I've got here 
is if I get more food supply, what happens to births? Well, that is going to go up. So more food supply means more births. So not only do I have a positive feedback loop up here, but I also have plus plus another positive feedback loop over here. And so, but in re but really these two positive feedback loops are just both driving growth. And this one negative feedback loop is constraining growth. And so this together, we might expect to have one of those S-shaped growth curves like we saw in the fisheries example. And so, um, so that's kind of another example where we, um, we just are looking for how these loops interact with each other. And then once we see that, trying to predict system behavior based on what we know about other systems. And we know with other systems, when you have a positive feedback loop next to a negative feedback loop, you get S-shaped growth. And that's what we predict for this system as well. Question. Yeah, population to food supply is a negative. There's a negative, a negative, and a negative. So there's. Oh well, maybe I uh, maybe I did this live and hurt myself there. So, yeah. So going well. So right. So I so going from births to population is a plus. Population of food supply is a negative. Food supply back to births is a plus. Yes, yes, absolutely. So I apologize for that. This year, I'm going to etch it out this should be a negative feedback loop. So now I actually have two negative feedback loops. I have the growth loop up here and then two constraining loops. So as I get more population, I get fewer births, but also as I get more population, I get more deaths. So I have two constraining forces, but I still will get this. Um, so it's still a growth loop next to a constraining loop. So that was my improvisational error, but it still ends up giving me S-shaped curve. So thank you for that, for that correction. Any other questions about this one? All right. So you can imagine adding a lot of other feedbacks here. Um, so you get other variables and things like that. And that's what we can start doing once we have tools that make that easy to do. So questions, and let me double check online if there's no questions that have been queuing up. So there have been questions. Um, so one of the questions uh, online is the homework going to be on VinSim? There will be a homework where you'll use VinSim, yes. And then there's another question. The inner system will always be opposite. I don't, that was a few seconds ago, it says. And I, I think, um, I don't know what they mean by, in inner, so these are the anonymous questions. I don't know what's meant by the inner system will always be opposite. If I go back to here, my guess is they're saying this system here and we would say this inner system, if that's what you're referring to, will always be a negative feedback loop. And that just means that every variable will have an opposite relationship to itself in the future. So if that kind of makes sense. So if I increase population, then ultimately I will, that'll end up stopping because it's like in the future, then it'll be decreased. That's kind of the way we think of negative feedback loops is they kind of self-regulate. They can't, um, the, they end up sort of keeping them, trying to keep themselves steady. That's the way we kind of conceptualize negative feedback loops. So hopefully that answered those anonymous questions. Okay, so what's left here? So what, um, so that's hopefully got warmed up thinking about these loops. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna show you an assignment that we, um, ideally you could start in class. We only have a few minutes left because my pace is a little slower with the hybrid setup here. Um, but, um, but it's a relatively simple assignment. We're gonna do some causal diagram drawing in VinSim. Ideally, if you can't do it in VinSim, I'm happy with using another tool because you know all the things that have to be there. Um, and so that will be due on Sunday along with the muddiest point assignment. And then we've got a reading uh, on Thursday. I've noticed a lot of people have already done the reading and been doing the perusal. There's like already a whole lot of comments and perusal. So, Great work for you guys, like working ahead. Um, and I've gone through and tried to answer a lot of those, those comments. Fine if you didn't, because it's not due yet or anything, but, but that will be due on Thursday. So all the reading stuff. All right, so this assignment, let me just introduce it. So in this assignment, um, the first part is going to show you an unlabeled 
causal loop diagram describing this system. So this is a system kind of from my past. And you know, you probably could do um, uh, uh, this with iPhone and Android as well. Um, but um, so we probably could have redrawn it, but this is just a, kind of an example that I borrowed and modified from another text. And so for those who, uh, this is unfamiliar terms, um, there, um, once upon a time, there were two VCR formats, two videotape formats, uh, one called VHS and the other one called Betamax. VHS uh, recorders looks like, or playback or players look like this. Betamax look like this. They don't look a lot of different. Um, there's various pros and cons of these things, but for the purpose of this uh, experiment or this exercise, you basically think they were equivalent technologies that just came out at the same time. And so um, these two technologies come out and they are kind of, their dynamics are described by this kind of kidney shaped causal loop diagram. And so there's VCRs are the generic term for these machines. And the two types of VCRs are VHS and beta. And so the idea here is that uh, what we're modeling here is the market share of these two as they compete against each other. And so this VHS market share, this is just the number of VHS VCRs divided by total VCRs. And so um, it, I could have done Betamax market share here and it just would have been Betamax in the numerator instead. So um, I think most of these should be relatively self-explanatory. In your VinSim, you're going to draw all of this yourself and then you're gonna label all of the links and then label the loops. And I can tell you there are two loops, this loop and this loop. And I'll give you the hint that these two loops are both going to be positive feedback loops. Now the link labels are not gonna be the same. So you might get more positives on one side than you will on the other, but ultimately you're gonna get an even number of negatives on both sides so that these both end up being positive feedback loops. And this is kind of a, a rich, um, the riches to the richer type of uh, uh, type of archetype that we'll end up getting to here. So this has got, or um, a competitive exclusion, uh, that's another kind of ecological example of this. So that's kind of the first part of that homework. And, um, and then the second part is you're gonna basically draw a simple uh, negative feedback loop like the one that I showed you. So like I said, like if I ever you know, asked you to draw a generic negative feedback loop, Unless I'm misquoting myself, the second part of the homework is basically pick a negative feedback loop and draw it. So, you know, hopefully you, you would think of, do I have a goal? Do I have an action? And do I have a level? And once you have those and you know where to plug them, then you know how to draw that loop with all the links labeled and loops labeled. And that's basically it. It's just sort of an exercise in drawing these causal loop diagrams and bins. So any questions on the assignment? Do Sunday. Yeah. Um, I'm still not too keen on what I'm I'm sorry, like, sometimes I have trouble saying it how to do things. Oh, that's fine. Um the plus is that I'm still having trouble figuring out the label on the LO. The the symbol uh, so yeah, so there's like a question of so how do you fig figure out the symbols on the arrows, like how to label the arrows? And the way I do it is I start with one side of the, of the arrow and I say um, beta tapes and stores. Well, I can say that, well, if you increase the beta tapes and stores, so stores have more Betamax tapes, what's going to happen to the VHS market share? Well, if there's more beta tapes and stores, then the, the denominator increased while the numerator didn't. So the market share is going to decrease. So I would say this would be a negative link here. So, um, whereas on the other side, I'd say, what happens if I increase my VHS tapes and stores? Well, if I increase the VHS tapes and stores, then what happens to the VHS market share? Well, if I increase the numerator here, then I'm going to increase the market share. So an increase in tapes and VHS tapes increases in market share. So I would say this is a positive. So that's kind of an example where I say, imagine a change in this side of the arrow is the change on the other side of the arrow in the same direction or the opposite direction if it's opposite it's a negative if it's the same it's a positive 
Any other questions? Question online, the assignment is due. Um, I see this is, so there's a, so online there are two questions. This is on our own right or with a partner. So I'm happy if you wanna to work together on this, but you have to, um, uh, I want you at least for the second part where you have to come up with your own, I want all those to be unique, but you definitely can work with each other on this one. That's fine. If you need sort of help, you know, these sorts of things. It says the assignment is due next Thursday on Canvas. Is it going to be changed to Sunday? Yeah, it's not supposed to be due next Thursday. Um, I'll um, double check that. The original thing was it's supposed to be due Sunday. So I'll go back and uh, double check that um, so that, because that was the intent that it's supposed to be due Sunday. Um, anything else? All right, so in that case, let's just give you this attendance assignment here. So I'll put the link in the chat for those following along at home. And the question I have here is, um, let's say, uh, let me think of a Vincent specific question. So maybe that question will be, uh, what is the tool in Vinsim called that lets you draw links? You draw links. So up at the top of Vinsim, there's a bunch of tools and you know, the, it's not called a link tool, I don't think in Vinsim. So what is the actual name of that tool called? And these are graded for completion, not correctness. And so even if you don't quite remember, as long as it's clear that you're answering a question related to that, then you're fine. And that's all I've got for you today. If you've got any other questions or anything, then feel free to bring them up after. Oh yeah, sorry, a question there. That's the attendance question is, um, what is the tool in VinSim called that lets you draw links? Okay. Otherwise, see you all Thursday. Have a good night. Just okay. But, um, this is how you like add something, right? You press that and then you type in something. Oh, well, well, that, what you clicked on there was the so called shadow variable. So, what you'll actually want is uh, if you mouse over the link, is um, it's going to be one of these over here. It's just a little, this one. that's the variable okay. tool. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we'll, we'll think, we'll talk about what that shadow variable is tool much later in the semester. Okay. And I got everything else. Okay. okay. Great. Um, and I just want to make sure online if there's no other questions, otherwise I will end the recording. Okay, see you all on Thursday. Just one second.